We're going to look at the present day application of Revelation 3.10. But we're also going to see the final fulfillment during what we understand is a time of trouble that is coming upon the earth. We will briefly look at both of them. And then, which if we have a little bit of time, we're going to look at a few events that are taking place in our world today to make sense of everything that is happening. So we will look at some news items. But here's the scripture reading. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. It says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. What's going to happen if we're faithful in this generation? This is the same testimony that God gave regarding Abraham. He says, Abraham kept my word. He kept my commandments. This is a testimony he gave about all throughout sacred history where he raised up people to accomplish something great for him. And this is a promise he gives to the final generation, to you and to me, my brothers and sisters. He's speaking to us. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. What's that hour of temptation? What is that all about? Brothers and sisters, this is talking about a trial, a test, a period, a time of trouble, which shall come upon the whole world. It's coming. If it's coming to the whole world, then there's a message that has to go to the whole world, to every nation, kinder, tongue, and people. It shall come to the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. This is not a regional conflict. Only twice in the history of this earth has there been a worldwide proclamation to the world about a test that's coming. The first time was in the day of Noah. It was a worldwide proclamation. The whole world was going to be affected. And in these last days, there's a message that's going to the whole world. A test, a time of testing is coming. The hour of temptation is coming. Because you've kept my word, that is our part that we fulfill, that we commit to. See, God gave the nation of Israel a covenant, a covenant that was based on promises and conditions. And God told Abraham and the children of Israel, if you heed my word, if you're willing to enter into this covenant relationship, I promise I'm going to fulfill certain blessings. That's what a contract is. That's what a covenant is. And here we see our part. If we keep his word, and because we are keeping his word, and because we're faithful to his word, the promise is this, I will keep you. That is a promise. Now, what does this mean? Let's look at this. This is from Review and Herald, July 9, 1908. It says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the temptation. Okay, that's, she's quoting Revelation 3.10. It goes on to say, in this scripture is brought to view the hour of temptation that is to try them that dwell upon the earth. We are now living in this trying hour. That's the reason. We see the world in the condition that it's in. That's why we see all the troubles and all the conflicts and the war and the death and the destruction and the anger and the hatred and the bitterness and the social divide that is tearing up society completely. Because we are now in this hour of temptation. Brothers and sisters, we need to be kept by divine power in this hour. We'll lose our mind worrying about 
the Holocaust, the nuclear explosions, you know, the food crisis, the climate crisis, and every other crisis, the, the, it, the, what is the baby formula crisis? Imagine that. You list the crisis, they're there, A to Z. Unless we're kept by divine power to keep us from losing our mind. The Bible says the men, the, the hearts of men will melt in fear for the things that are coming unless you're kept by divine power. There is no escape, I continue to read, there is no escape for any from this conflict. We were born in this conflict. Well, I don't want to, well, you know what? You don't have to get involved. But there's another party in this conflict that's not going to stop. There's an enemy, there's an adversary who's in this conflict, and he's not going to stop. He's going to continue his assault and his warfare against God's people. So you could choose to throw your weapons down, but the other side's not going to throw the weapons down. What happens in those situations? When one side puts up the white flag and the other side says, we're not going to accept that. We know what happens. We were born in this conflict. It goes on to say, if in your life we have a work to do, we have a duty to do, there's a work of preparation. If in your life there are defective traits of character that you are not striving to overcome, you may be assured that the enemy will endeavor to take advantage of them, for he is watching vigilantly, seeking to spoil the faith of everyone. If you have weaknesses in your life, that's what the enemy is going to exploit. That's what he's going to use. Your weakness, your weak points. If you don't develop those characteristics, if you don't put on the armor of God, that's where the enemy is going to assail us through. For what purpose? To destroy your faith. If I have a weakness, Satan is going to use that to try to destroy my faith, to destroy my confidence so I could yield to temptation, so I can sever my allegiance and my faithfulness to God, and I lose out. That's what he's going to use. We have work to do in this time, in our own personal lives, in this hour of temptation. We're in it today. And we should be, as we read, striving to overcome. But Andy, how am I going to do this? How can I ever achieve that? We're told it's impossible, some people say. Well, let's keep reading. Here's the hope. In order to gain the victory over every besentment of the enemy, we must lay hold of a power that is out of and beyond ourselves. It's not within you to gain this victory. There's a power, there's divine power that's outside of us that seeks to come in. Notice what it says. We must maintain what kind of a relationship with Christ? What kind of a relationship? A constant living connection with Christ who has power to give victory to every soul that will maintain an attitude of faith and humility. Where is the victory contained in? It's in a relationship. What kind of relationship? A bad relationship? You know, there's different kinds of relationships. You know, there's good and there's bad relationships. And what kind of relationship is going to give me that victory in this hour of temptation in which we're living in right now? It's a constant living connection. Is that a dead, faithless on again and off again, on again and off again. You know what that kind of relationship is? Have you heard of that relationship? Have you seen those relationships? Where everything's good for a little while, and then it gets really bad for a little while. But then it gets really great for a little while. But then it, it's like up and down, up and down, like a yo-yo. Who wants that? Christ doesn't want that. That's not what Christ wants to give us. 
No, my brothers and sisters, God wants to settle the issue once and for all in our lives. You know what the word to settle it? He wants to seal it. The Bible speaks about the seal of the living God. We're going to be sealed. God's faithful people will be sealed in their foreheads with the seal of the living God, which is a sign of ownership. But what does it mean? It means that we're settled upon the truth. We cannot be moved because we are connected. And it's not an on again and off again. It's not going to end when the sun goes down tonight. And then I put on, you know, then I, then I have my, my public life. You know, I got my private life here when I come to church, but then I have a, a, you know, a different kind of life when I'm not in church. No, brothers. That's a sure formula for defeat and failure in this hour of temptation in which we're in. Make no mistake. But you know, brothers and sisters, there is also a future application Great Controversy, page 560. There's a future application when the world will come apart during what is called the great time of trouble that is coming upon this earth. And we read from Great Controversy 560, just before us is the hour of temptation. We're in it today, but it's, it's, it's not going to get better. Not for some people. For God's people, it's only going to get better if you're connected. Just before us is the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the world. And it doesn't matter what country. Oh, well, you know what? We have a country we're going to run away to. Well, it's going to be there too. It might even be worse. Listen, friends, there's not another nation to flee to. The only hope for Jesus is to come and take us to a better land, to a better place. That's the only hope. It's coming to the whole world. She quotes Revelation 3.10. All whose faith is not firmly established upon the word of God. What's going to happen to them? Oh, but Andy, I'm in church. Andy, I participate in the programs. I'm involved. I have a position. I have title. That's not what it says. Jesus, the promise, because you've kept my word. That's what gives you the right and the authority to claim the promise that God will keep us in the hour of temptation. It doesn't say because you have a title. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with that, a title. There's nothing wrong with positions. There's nothing wrong with part participating in programs. But let that foundation, let the purpose for those things be because we want to follow the word. Because you've kept the word, notice, Unless our faith is firmly established. What does that mean? Does that mean that we compromise God's word? Does it mean that we read something and we say, wow, let me see if I can over contextualize the verse so that it means something that God never said it meant. How about that? How about rationalize the word? How about neutralize the word? How about explain it away to give it a different meaning? No, friends. And you know, we are experts at doing those things. I don't know if you've noticed that. We are experts at trying to find a way where we can get around what the Word says. Instead of just showing humility and just showing obedience. We try to find a way to make it say something it doesn't say or to justify or to excuse things that God says He's not going to excuse. Well, let's look at the next one. Volume 6 of the Testimonies, 404. The great crisis is just before us. To meet its trials and temptations and to perform its duties will require what kind of a faith? Persevering faith. What kind of faith do we have this morning? A lifeless a stagnant, a compromising faith. Friends, that kind of faith will be worthless in the time of temptation. Not just today, but what's coming in the future. However, a persevering faith is a living faith. 
It's a faith that believes and trusts what God says. And what does it mean? What's a persevering faith? Well, when God says something, by the way, when he told the nation of Israel, yes, you can have the promised land. It's yours. Take it. That's what God said. But there's giants. And there's fortified cities. And there, the, the armies are so, are, are so numerous. And you can, you can add your own if you want to. Well, I can't, I can't keep the Sabbath. I'll lose my job. I can't obey God. You know, what will happen? My friends, you can add all your excuses. God told the nation of Israel, the land is yours, take it. If they would have maintained a persevering faith, they would have went in and taken the land and would have possessed it. They would have trusted God's word. They would have obeyed God's word. If you have a persevering faith, you don't have to understand. That's, faith doesn't answer all the questions. Faith says, I trust what God says. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he said, and it's, it's on him, it's not on me. I'm going to obey what God says. That's what faith is. It's like the song says, trust and obey. Maybe we need to sing that song. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. It goes on to say, listen, but we may triumph gloriously. It's not just a victory. It's going to be a complete victory, a glorious victory. How? Not one watching, prayer, praying, believing soul will be ensnared by the enemy. Watching, praying, believing. Praise the Lord. A glorious victory awaits those who are watching, who are praying, and who are believing. It doesn't say sleeping, careless, inactive, unbelieving, giving excuses, compromising, and all the other things that, unfortunately, many times we ourselves. No, that's not the solution. So what does it mean to be kept? What does it mean to be kept? Listen to this, Great Controversy 560. And here again, they quote the verse, because you've kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee. Is the Savior's promise, Revelation 3.10. What does it mean to be kept? In the hour of temptation. If we do our part, okay, Andy, you've talked to us about our part. What will God promise to do? What will be his part? Listen to this. This, this is amazing. This is truly amazing. It says, he, that's the Lord, would sooner send every angel out of heaven to protect his people. Does God have a lot of angels? You can read in Revelation, I believe it's 5.11. We're not going to turn there. Just around the throne of God. We're talking about just the throne of God. We're not talking about his whole vast creation and the ever-expanding universe. We're not talking about all the corners of all the different planets and the different galaxies. We're just talking about the throne of God. Just around the throne, okay? Small section. You can read in Revelation chapter 5, 11, that just around the throne, it says that there are 10,000 times 10,000 angels. Now, what is, how much is 10,000 times 10,000? Who has a smartphone who can just punch in the numbers? What's, I have the answer, but what's 10,000 times 10,000? Somebody help me. 100 million. But it's more than that. Because Revelation 5, 11 says, and thousand thousands. What's 1,000 times 1,000? Somebody with an iPhone. How much? 
one million. So just by the throne of God, we, we know that at minimum, there's 101 million angels just by the throne. That's not talking about all the rest. And what's amazing is that in 2 Kings 19.35, God's people were at war. And they were about to be destroyed. And God sent how many angels to deliver them? One angel. And that one angel destroyed the Assyrian army of 185,000 men. And it didn't take a lot of effort. One angel destroyed all the enemies of God's people. And we just read that if it's necessary, it's not necessary, but if it's necessary, God will empty all of heaven. He'll send all the reserves from all over the world. It says every angel out of heaven to protect his people than to leave one soul. Brothers and sisters, he'll do it for you. He'll do it for you. He already gave his son for you. He'll send every angel. Remember, the angels wanted to give their lives for us. Remember when Jesus revealed the plan of salvation? The angel said, no, Lord, don't go. We'll go. We'll go. And they'll all come just to save one soul that puts their trust in Christ, who's connected to Christ, who has kept the word. Brothers and sisters, what does that mean? You know what that means? It means we don't have anything to worry about. We don't have anything to worry about. You don't have to worry about the mark of the beast or the image of the beast or the number of the beast. God is bigger than all those things. What we must preoccupy ourselves with is to fear God and keep His commandments. And to give glory to Him. That's where our faith and that's where our trust must be centered upon. Because God will take care of everything else if we can take care of that part. Love our Lord thy God. Keep keep the word. Because you've kept my word, I will keep you. Did he keep Daniel from the lion's den? Did he not send the angels to close the mouth of the lions? Was he not with the Hebrews? who were faithful, the young Hebrew boys who were faithful, because they kept his word. God promised to keep them. And this is a promise for these last days. Yes, the globalists and yes, the certain organizations and certain people are planning tyranny. They're planning it right now. Yes, they want to suspend all our liberties. Yes, they want us to, they want to keep us locked down. Yes, they they got a lot of plans. But God says, just be faithful to my word. But that faithfulness to the word doesn't just mean to believe and receive it. It also means that we have to communicate it. We'll see that in just a second. So my brothers and sisters, if you know Jesus, if you're connected to him, what kind of a connection? The on again, off again, the up and down, the good and the bad, that no, brothers. A constant living connection. Constant living connection. If we have that relationship, we don't have anything to worry about. Now, I don't believe in scaring people. I don't believe in, you know, the hellfire brimstone preaching where you scare people into the kingdom. But listen, brothers and sisters, there are things that are coming to the world. And if you don't know Jesus, <laughs> listen, There are some things. You don't want to be outside of the protection of God. Let's just put it that way. You don't want to be outside of his protection. You want to have this relationship. You want to have this connection. You don't want to keep yourself in the great hour of temptation that is coming upon the earth. You don't want to keep yourself. You want to be kept by divine power. But there are things in this world that are coming, that should give us pause, that should cause us to consider if you want God to keep you or if you think you you got it all up here, you can figure out what's coming in this world. I don't want to be in that situation. There are things that are coming. The Bible says the the hearts of men will, will melt for fear 
for the things that are coming upon the earth. So what will be the heart of this conflict? What's at the center of the hour of temptation? Well, it has to do with the mark of the beast and the son of law crisis. Let me read to you from Review and Herald, June 19, 1900. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. Notice how she throws the first part of the verse in the first sentence. And then the last part, the promise at the end of this paragraph. She split the verse. Because you've kept my word. God says, I will keep you. She split those two, and then she added a lot of things in the middle. And this is what it means. This is the interpretation. This is what inspiration tells us. Because you've kept the word of my patience. Does this apply to men who persecute those who conscientiously keep the commandments of God? Who refuse to bow down to an idol Sabbath and worship an institution of the papacy? That's the question. Is this not what it applies to? The coming Sunday law crisis. Coming Sunday law crisis. Listen, brothers and sisters, the Sunday test will surely come. It is even now approaching. Who is keeping the word of God's patience? This is a question of intense interest, a question which none of us can afford to ignore. You can't ignore it. It's not going away if you choose to ignore it. You know when this ostrich sticks his head in the, in the hole because he doesn't want to see the lion? The lion's not going to go anywhere. The lion is still going to be there. It goes on to say, because God has said to those who keep the word of his patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. This is talking about the mark of the beast Sunday law crisis. You say, but Andy, what? I don't see anything. I don't hear anything. I haven't heard. What are you talking about? Who's talking about that? No one's, that's not even an issue today. Well, look at the top part. This is from May 7, 2021. The Wall Street Journal. Have you heard of the Wall Street Journal? Okay, well, what do they say? In May of 2021, just last year. Just last year, my brothers and sisters. It says, we, what we've lost in rejecting the Sabbath. Are they talking about the seventh day? Are they talking about the commandments of God? Are they talking about keeping the word? No. It says, setting aside one day a week for rest and prayer used to be an American tradition. In an age of constant activity, we need it more than ever. What are they talking about? They're talking about an hour of temptation that's going to come, a test that's going to come to the whole world. They want a day of rest. Well, what day of rest is that? Notice this one. The bottom part is another news source, news agency. And notice what they said in December of 18, 2021. That's not a year ago. That's what, six months ago? Six months ago. At least I can count that. Reenact blue laws. What is that? What is a blue law? That's a Sunday law. That's a law that said you're going to worship on this day or you go to jail. You're going to lose everything. Reenact blue laws to combat worker shortages and curb inflation. Now, I, I know I shouldn't talk about inflation. I know we can't talk about that in church. Some will say that's a political but is inflation going up? Is it going up or is it going down? It's going up. And what's the solution? Well, according to some, Sunday is a solution. Sunday is going to solve everything for us. That's what they're saying. Economically, the blue laws would reduce the demand of and increase supply, which would curb the out-of-control inflation. No, it's not going to curb. It's not going to curb none of that. Quit printing money. Well, I shouldn't have said that. Quit spending. Quit borrowing. Quit spending more than you actually make. 
Is that a biblical principle? Yes, it is. Live within your means. No, no, no. You can still spend. You can still borrow. You can still live reckless. But Sunday is going to solve all the inflation. The supply chain. Have you heard of a supply chain? Have you heard of empty grocery stores and no construction equipment to build? Have you heard that there's, we're having issues with the, the ships delivering produce and commerce and stuff? Sunday's a solution. That was six months ago. Watch this. February, we're getting closer. February 11, 2022. Not just nostalgia. Some pandemic weary souls want to make Sunday a day of rest again. And that's from, you can see the website up there. But now they're saying, you know, the pandemic has helped us to realize that we need Sunday once again. What are you talking about, brothers and sisters? Well, everyone's locked down. They should have at least some kind of relief. So you can read the article and they're saying we need this. Sunday's going to save us from the pandemic. It's also going to save us. Notice this. March 18. That's closer, right? We're getting closer to our time. Car free Sundays. The IEA, that's the International Energy Agency, a global organization that wants to dictate, not just to the United States or to the developed nations, they want to dictate policy to the world. And what is their recommendation? What is their advice? What is their solution to oil? Have you heard of oil crisis? Have you had to put gas in your car? What's, what's going on with oil? What's going on with gas prices? There's a solution for this, the experts tell us. The experts say, we have an answer, car-free Sunday. Rest on Sunday. Don't drive your car on Sunday. This is from The Guardian. Driving more slowly... On Monday through Saturday, just drive slowly. Turning down your conditioning. Well, they they don't, whoever said that, they don't don't live in Oklahoma in the summertime. And car-free Sundays should be adopted as emergency measures to reduce the global demand for oil. What's going to solve the global oil crisis? Sunday. 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 It's coming. The crisis is coming. Here's another one. When was this? How many years ago was this, Sister Beverly? A couple days ago. This is CBS News. And CBS News, and there's a link, you can follow the link, you can watch the whole video. They're saying that, you know, faith matters today. We need to have faith. It matters. It's important. And why we as Christians have to worship on Sunday. Everybody. It's not just the churches that are saying this. It's it's not just the secular organizations. It's not just the politicians that are saying this. Everyone is saying Sunday, 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 Sunday. Let me read to you a little bit from the article. It says, for many Christians... You know, they mention Adventists here. That's why I'm bringing this to your attention. They mention Adventists. It says, for many Christians, Sunday is set aside for for rest. Then they quote this pastor. And it says that uh, the doctor so-and-so said, while some Christians, just some, like Seventh-day Adventists, worship on Saturday, the majority go to church on Sunday. And you know, he gave statistics in this, in this article. It's actually a video. You can watch the video if you just go to that link. He gave statistics and he says, over 98% of Christians, we keep Sunday. 
98%. How can 98% be wrong? That means less than 2%. It's only less than 2% of Christians today. You know, it's a small number. You know, the Bible calls them the remnant people. It's just a small number. The first Christians were Hebrews to begin with. And so that's why throughout the New Testament, it is said many times that Jesus and his disciples went to the temple and went to the synagogue. They were living out their Jewish faith. The reason why they kept Saturday is because they were just living out the Jewish faith. Oh, brothers, it's, who said it was a Jewish faith? They saying it's a Jewish faith. They also said that the Ten Commandments, that was part of the Jewish faith. The moral law, that was all Jewish. The Sabbath, that was Jewish. Even though in the book of Genesis, when God blessed the seventh day, there was only Adam and Eve, right? Were they, who were they? What race were they from? Were they Jewish? German? Italian? Spanish? No, brothers, they, they were the children of God. They were the creation of God. And God gave the Sabbath... Abraham is considered the first Jew way before Abraham was born. So he goes on to say, they were living out their Jewish faith. But as Christianity began to spread throughout the known Roman world, oh, there's a connection between the Roman world and what's happening. Yes, my brothers and sisters, it's Rome. It's, it's still Rome today. And we're going to close. We're going to close with some wonderful news. We're going to look at some good news. But yes, he's saying it was the Roman world. It was Rome at that time. You know, the Gentiles converted to Christianity slowly but surely. They began to worship on Sundays. And, and this is what's being promoted. This is what's being pushed. This is what's being communicated upon the world. Not just through the religious groups, but through secular groups, social groups, everyone. Now, here's the good news. Now, this was about a month ago. A little over a month ago. We're still in May, so this was April. Remembering the Sabbath. And this was in the Royal Gazette, by the way. The Royal Gazette is um, the largest daily online and print edition in this nation. Let me tell you what nation it is. Uh, it was in the nation of Bermuda. Man, why couldn't it be uh, somewhere here in the United States? Maybe it ought to be. Maybe, maybe it needs to be Oklahoma next. What do you think? But this is what happened in Bermuda. A little island somewhere out in the Caribbean. One, one of our neighbors, my sister, out way, well, I think they're further north. But anyways, this is what the secular paper said. This is what was published in the largest digital and print newspaper in the nation of Bermuda. It says, the Sabbath is a 24-hour period observed from sunset on Friday to sunset on Saturday each week. This practice dates back to creation and is also kept by those of the Jewish faith. So that's how the newspaper started. But then they, they quote somebody. Pastor Kenneth Manders, president of the Bermuda Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, explains its significance. The seventh day is the day of the Lord, blessed and sanctified at the end of creation. He completed his work and rested. He asked us to do, to keep it holy. He goes on to say, observing the seventh day as a Sabbath is one of the 28 fundamental beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists. It was established in Genesis reinforcing the Ten Commandments. The Sabbath is a day of reflection, it's a day of reflection enjoyment, worship for God's people. And then at the bottom it says, He created the Sabbath for mankind. That's what Jesus said. Mark 2, 27 and 28. The Sabbath was made for man. The Greek word means mankind, anthropos. There is a blessing to it. It's not a holiday or an excuse to work. It is sacred time. where We're called to commune with God. Mr. Mander said, Sabbath keeping is a practice mentioned several times in the Bible in both the Old and the New Testament. This is what the first angel's message teaches. 
The first angel's message says, fear God and give glory to him and worship him who made the heavens. That's the creator, right? The one who made the heavens and the earth is the creator. How do we worship the creator? Somebody help me. How do we worship the creator? What's that? By keeping his laws. Is there anything specific in the law? The Sabbath. How do we worship the creator? For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. And he rested the Sabbath day. And he blessed the Sabbath day. And that's why we remember the Sabbath day. Because we remember him as a creator. The first angel's message is a call to keep the Sabbath holy. That's the first angel's message. What about the third angel's message? What does the third angel's message say? It's a warning message, right? If any man worship the beast, his image, or receive his what? His mark. That's a warning message that has to be given. It has to be given by somebody. And praise the Lord, my brothers and sisters. Praise the Lord that this same brother, president of the conference there in Bermuda, praise the Lord, he didn't just give the first angel's message. You can't just give positive truth without warning people that there's a danger out there. Notice what happens. I'm going to continue reading. However, notice what this president in Bermuda said. However, the majority of Christian denominations have abandoned Sabbath keeping. Is that ecumenical? Is that an ecumenical statement? No, it's not. Is it the truth? Yes, it is. The majority of Christians have abandoned the Sabbath, specifically the reverence for the seventh day of the week. Instead, the day of rest and collective worship is held on Sunday throughout most of the Western world. This change formally came about in 321 AD when the Roman Emperor Constantine issued a civil decree making Sunday a day of rest from labor across the Roman Empire. Is that an ecumenical message? No, it's not, brothers. But it's the truth. It's a warning. He, can, he closes by saying this. The world has found its own rationale to justify breaking this commandment. Friends, that's not an ecumenical message, but it's the truth. Ecumenism today says we have our day and you have your day and it doesn't really matter. You know, God knows our hearts. Brothers, that's what ecumenism teaches. That's what a lot of people have been saying. But this, this brother here says... You find they have found a reason to justify the breaking of God's commandments. But Adventists, the commandment keeping Christians, we believe that the fourth commandment is still relevant, as important as the other nine. While the world may observe Sunday as a day of rest, the Bible has been clear and consistent of the seventh day as a Sabbath, regardless of what the world is doing. Praise the Lord. It's true. This was in Bermuda just last month in the secular press to the whole nation. The little, it's a small island nation, but the whole nation had an opportunity to hear the final testing message in the hour of temptation, which is going to come upon the whole world. Notice this. He goes on to say, there are some, what, what kind of, man, that's, a, that's not a nice way to start a sermon. If I stand up and say, there are some brothers, that's not very nice. But it's true. There are some. There are many. There are some who will say that Jesus nailed the Sabbath to the cross and done away with this practice. But this is simply not true. How many say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Where, where are the men and women that will dare to speak out the truth of God in love, but without hesitation? 
It says, Jesus died for our sins, not to give us a license to sin. How many could say amen to that? Is God's grace a license to just continue to live in sin? No, it's not. But people have said differently. It goes on to say, not to give a license to sin, but to absolve us from the penalty of sin through the acceptance of Him as our Lord and Savior. And this was in Bermuda. Why couldn't this be here in the States? Why couldn't it have been in California, Texas, a- anywhere, Oklahoma? Here's, we close with this. Yes, there's an hour of temptation that's coming. Yes, we have to realize that God will have a faithful remnant who will faithfully declare his word regardless of the circumstances. God will have a faithful people. And listen, my brothers and sisters, we're not called just to keep the Sabbath. We're called to communicate the truth of the, on the Sabbath. We're called to encourage other people to keep the Sabbath. Abraham was a faithful soul, a faithful person. But he wasn't just called to abide in the covenant and to keep the covenant. He was commanded to teach his children to keep the commandments as well. So we are called to teach others and to show others the truth. And we close with this. Manuscript 16. There must be no toning down of the truth. Amen? Did this pastor, did he, did he tone down the truth? Did he tone down the truth? Did he hide the truth? Oh, brothers, I wish to God that we would have the same fortitude in our life, in our homes, in our society. Aren't you glad that in the tracts that we mail out here, we don't just tell people about that Jesus loves them. We tell them that Jesus loves them. We tell them that he's coming again. But we also tell them about the Sabbath. We tell them about the testing truth, the testing message, the hour of temptation that is here and that is going to continue to develop. It says, we close, there must be no toning down of the truth, no muffling of the message. The third angel's message must be strengthened and confirmed. Some have thought it best to gradually prepare the way for the presentation of the Sabbath question. Let's do it after about 15, 16 weeks. Then we'll, we might mention it to them after 16 weeks. Oh, brothers and sisters. In fact, the article that was published in that paper in Bermuda, there wasn't, it wasn't a 16-week Bible study. It was a one-shot opportunity to tell people about the Sabbath. And not only did he tell them about the Sabbath, he warned them against the mark of the beast. He gave the first and the third angel's message. Some had thought it best to gradually do this. The Sabbath truth is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and presented in the 58th chapter of Isaiah. What does Isaiah 58 say? Cry aloud. Spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and tell my people their sin. Did he say that the desecration of the Sabbath is the breaking of God's commandments and that God did not give us a license to sin? Yes, he did. He said those things. There has been too much beating about the bush. You know what that means, beating about the bush? Brothers and sisters, we're beating about the bushes. That means that we're so ambiguous in the presentation of God's truth. It means we, we go around this way, and then we come around this way, and then we, we're just beating about the bushes. Come out from under the bushes. Jesus says, you're the light of the world. Men do not take a candle and put it under the bushel, under the bushes. Beating about the bushes. No, brothers and sisters. There's been too much beating about the bush. It goes on to say, with the proclamation of the trade angel's message, the message has to be given as clearly and distinctly as it should have been. 
listen, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, they didn't beat about the bush. The three Hebrew boys, they weren't hiding under the bushes when the command says bow to the image. They didn't go hiding under the bushes. They stood straight. They kept the word of God. And the promise, my brothers, we close with this thought. The promise is because you've kept my word. Praise the Lord, we have faithful men and women in God's remnant people who keep the word and they proclaim the word with boldness, with faithfulness. Let us be that kind of a people. Because you've kept my word, he promises. I promise, I will keep you in this hour of temptation. That it's here now, but it's coming. Relentless in its fury, a storm is coming. But there's a hiding place from the storm and from the tempest. And if we are faithful to God today, if we can stand for him today, he promised that he, we will be kept by divine power in the crisis that's coming ahead. That's the only way we can get to the time of trouble. That's the only way we'll be ready for Jesus to come. Let's bow our heads. We thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. We thank you, Lord, that you've called us at such a momentous hour as this. Help us, Lord, to be faithful. Help us, Lord, to to seek you. We don't know how, Lord, you're going to give us this experience. But you've told us that if we abide in your word and if we establish this connection, this living connection with you, that therein lies the success to victory. Oh, Father, we need that more than ever. We need more victory today where there's only, we see defeats and failures and misery. You have everything we need. We pray that we may come to you while it is still time, while there is still an opportunity. Yes, Lord, it's not too late. Soon the doors will forever close, but it's still not too late today. Help us in that decision and help us to remain in that uh, relation with you. Not just here, but when you come in glory and throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. That is our prayer and our desire. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.